Greetings and welcome to today's webinar, Using Laboratory Folate Status Assessment to Strengthen Neural Tube Defect Prevention. We have an exciting program planned and I want to thank you for joining us. Today's webinar is hosted by Nutrition International's Folate Task Team. The Folate Task Team leads an expert advisory group and collaborates with partners and stakeholders to coordinate global action to reduce folate-sensitive neural tube defects and to strengthen prevention efforts at the country level. I am Aliki pappas Weekland, Project Consultant for the Folate Task Team. I will serve as moderator for today's webinar together with Ms. Jessica Poulin, the team's Knowledge Translation Officer. Before we begin, I'll share a bit of information on neural tube defects for those who may, not, who may be unfamiliar. In recent years, many countries have seen reductions in under five mortality from infectious diseases. One of the results has been the realization for greater focus on the prevention of other causes of child mortality in order to achieve further improvements in child survival. Birth defects, including neural tube defects, as causes of child mortality, have greater significance and must be considered in country strategies for reaching the health outcomes targeted in the Sustainable Development Goals Year 2030. Neural tube defects are made up of a group of severe birth defects that affect the brain and spine. Neural tube defects, also known as NTDs, develop within the first 28 days of pregnancy, often before a woman knows she's pregnant. For this reason, it is critical that prevention efforts begin before and continue throughout pregnancy. Folate plays a key role in the closure of the neural tube during gestation. When folate concentration is below the optimal level recommended during early pregnancy, the neural tube is at risk of not closing, resulting in exposure or malformation of the spinal cord or brain. Improving maternal folate status through folic acid fortification or supplementation can dramatically reduce the number of effective births and significantly contribute to reducing neonatal and child mortality. Today's webinar will provide information on current efforts to harmonize folate laboratory assessment methods globally to strengthen NTD prevention efforts. I'd, I'd like to go over a few logistics before we begin. All of your lines should be muted, but your chat function is enabled. Throughout the presentations, please do send any questions or discussion points to the host, anything that you'd like to raise via the chat function. Time permitting, we'll plan to address one to two questions following each presentation. And then we've also planned for ample time at the end of the program for more questions and discuss discussion. So without further delay, I'd like to get us started today. Uh, Jessica, if you would, please introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Aliki. Our first speaker is Dr. Homero Martinez. Um, he joined Nutrition International in 2016 as Senior Advisor to the Micronutrient Forum. In that role, Homero was responsible for steering the activities of the Micronutrient Forum to follow its strategic plan and address key barriers to achieve micronutrient adequacy for individuals and populations. Dr. Martinez has ample experience in public health nutrition, specifically addressing different forms of malnutrition in vulnerable populations, including young children in developing countries. His research addresses several micronutrient deficiencies, including iodine, iron, vitamin A, and zinc, as well as interventions to address the overweight and obesity epidemic. Nutri uh, nutritional and hydration management of children with acute diarrhea, home care of acute res respiratory infections, nutritional needs for people living with HIV and AIDS, training of primary healthcare workers, and assessment of fluid intake in different populations. Dr. Martinez is fluent in Spanish and English. He has held teaching appointments with, in, with different institutions, mentoring various graduate students. Dr. Martinez has also occupied senior level administrative positions related to research. He is a clinical pediatrician and has a PhD in international nutrition with minors in medical anthropology and clinical epidemiology. Thank you, Dr. Martinez, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Jessica, and thank you for the kind introduction, Aliki. Uh, I'm going to uh, give you a very brief introduction about the project that is uh, supporting this webinar and what we call the Folic Task Team, thanks to the generous uh, support and funds from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, 
uh, uh, next slide, please. So, uh, as Jessica mentioned, uh, uh, a few years back, the Macronutrient Forum uh, convened here at Nutrition International a technical consultation on polystatus in women and neural tube defect prevention. The idea was to bring the uh, knowledge around the table to uh, update where we were both in assessing folate status as well as the burden of NTD around the world and to help put together this, uh, including some other considerations uh, like the need to include vitamin B12 in folate interventions or the safety of uh, folic acid fortification and to try to put all of, all of this information together in order to identify knowledge gaps on the one hand and a possible way forward so as to build a roadmap for implementation with a specific focus in low to middle income countries. Next slide, please. Uh, there were several papers contributing to this paper, uh, to, to this um, consultation that were developed as part of it. Uh, we had 11 uh, publications that I will refer to at the end of the presentation, which were published in the Annals of the New York Academy of Sciences, but there were two particularly relevant for the work that we're going to be reviewing today. On the one hand, the work that Lisa Rogers and her collaborators put together with a systematic review on folate status assessment in women of reproductive age around the world. And on the second hand, the very interesting proposal that Christine Pfeiffer and her work put together to develop a framework for laboratory harmonization of folate measurements in low and middle income countries. In brief, what Lisa and her group identified was a big gap of information around the world in using the proper assessment to evaluate folly status in women of reproductive age. And what Christine and her work put together is this framework by which we could provide resources around the world to properly assess folly status in populations. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the main challenges that were uncovered by the uh, uh, consultation was that, uh, of course, improving the folate status of women of reproductive age before they are pre pregnant can help prevent a majority of folate responsive NTDs. This was amply known before the consultation, but we identified several challenges. Two of them uh, included the limited information that I mentioned on folate status and the limited use and availability of labs properly trained uh, to assess folate status. The next one, please. So to address and overcome these challenges, Nutrition International proposed in collaboration with the CBC to develop a project that will help us identify regional laboratories using WHO as a framework for, uh, region, uh, uh, for, for the regionalization of the world to identify at least one or two in each of these regions with two trainees in each of them provide these labs with the equipment and reagents necessary to conduct the microbiological assay that will determine red blood cell folate, produce a training video to help shorten up the training time and to set the basis for a future global network. This will be amply developed throughout the presentation, so I will take no more further time. Next slide, please. And just uh, uh, as, a, as a way of framework around capacity building, we do recognize that providing the skills to technicians is not enough to really help to systematically help to build approach. Technicians need the tools uh, to develop the skills that they have acquired. Once they have the skills, they need the staffing infrastructure that will allow them to develop their, uh, their new knowledge. Uh, to properly do this, they require structure, systems, proper roles, and we will be talking about this in the context of uh, this uh, uh, capacity building around laboratory uh, skills. Uh, once the structures and systems are in roles, they will enable the staff and infrastructure which is in place to uh, allow the technicians to use the skills and uh, apply the proper tools to actually be able to improve the situation that we're dealing with. Uh, the next slide, please. Without further ado, I will pass on the, the uh, floor to Jess, who will introduce our next speaker. Jess, back to you. 
Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Omero. This is Aliki. I'm going to jump in just, um, we have time for one or two questions. I want to remind participants to please submit them via the chat function to the host. And you can do this throughout the entire webinar. Uh, even if you have questions on a, a presenter who has already gone, we will have time at the end to um, field those questions and have a discussion. Omero, there is one um, question that for you. Uh, does the folate task team work only with global groups or are there plans to work um, in country? Wonderful question. Thank you very much. The idea of the folate task team is that it will bring together the global expertise around the topic, but we want to focus specifically in country or sub country with local teams. So what we will plan to do or what we have been doing is to actually bring uh, resources together in response to the uh, needs of the countries and to do a very ad, ad hoc intervention or support of an intervention depending on the local situation. Thank you very much, Romero. Jess, over to you. Great, thank you, Homero, and thank you, Aliki. Our next speaker is Dr. Christine Pfeiffer. Dr. Pfeiffer is the Chief of the Nutritional Biomarkers Branch in the Division of Laboratory Sciences at the, at the CDC's National Center for Environmental Health. She received her BS, MS, and PhD in Food science, Sciences from the Uni University of Car Karlsruhe, Germany. Dr. Pfeiffer joined the CDC in 1996, where her research focuses on the development of the state-of-the-art analytical methods for the measurement of nutritional indicators and biological matrices and the application of these methods to the National Health and Nutritional Examination Survey and other epidemiologic studies. Dr. Pfeiffer is a leading expert on folate and B vitamins and logistical issues regarding the biomonitoring of nutritional indicators. She has authored over 100 peer-reviewed manuscripts, led the production of two major agency reports on nutritional biomarkers in NHANES, served on national and international committees, and has been an invited speaker at a majority of international conferences. Over to you, Christine. Thank you so much, Aliki, for this uh, very kind introduction. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to update people on what we have done over the last nine months towards setting up international laboratories for the folate microbiologic assay with the ultimate goal to harmonize folate measurements. And this morning, I'm the voice uh, for several staff in my laboratory, specifically Dr. Mindy Zhang and uh, Shamim Jabbar, who worked very hard on this project, as well as Dorothy Hausman, who is supporting this project through the CDC Foundation. But as you can imagine, there are many people involved uh, in a project like this. Next, please. And next. Thank you. Uh, I have no specific um, items to disclose, uh, but would like to opportunity here to uh, thank to the Gates Foundation and Nutrition International for supporting this important work. Next. This morning, I will walk you through uh, arguments why we propose that the folate microbiologic assay is important and why we suggest a regional approach, what important components are for a successful capacity building project, and what our main project goal and objectives are. I'll talk a little bit about the training approach we are taking and how we're engaging laboratories, what our progress has been thus far, and a few words to the way forward. And uh, Omira pointed out the articles from the supplement. Uh, and so if this all sounds interesting to you, please feel free to read up a little bit more on the framework um, that we published last year. Next, please. So what is folate? Folate is a water-soluble B vitamin. It's important in one carbon metabolism. And Aliki already gave us a nice uh, explanation of the connection between folate status and neural tube defect risk. And so folate is really, having a good folate status is really needed during periods of growth and development. So very early in pregnancy, in childhood, those are the critical periods. Next. 
Measuring uh, folate in the lab is really uh, difficult and there are multiple analytical challenges. Some of them are related to the compound itself. Others are related to sample collection procedures. Folate is not really just one compound. It's a group of um, different folate vitamins with similar chemical structure. Most of those are sensitive. They are susceptible to oxidation, decomposition, and interconversions. Uh, levels of folate, particularly in serum, are quite low and thus hard to measure. And in whole blood, um, the folates need to be deconjugated from poly to monoglutamate so that they can be measured. And so one needs to accurately generate a hemolysate of whole blood, otherwise the specimen is not appropriate for measurement. So all in all, one needs well-controlled collection, processing, and storage conditions to generate accurate results. Next, please. So why are we suggesting to use the folate microbiologic assay? Next. This is uh, one of three major types of analytical methods, and it is the oldest technique, um, but it is a simple and inexpensive technique. Simple because uh, what you need is a folate-dependent microorganism, and you sort of feed it with a medium that has everything the microorganism needs to grow with the exception of folate. And then depending on how much folate there is in the specimen, the microorganism grows proportionally to that. And all you need is basically a, a series of different pipettes, uh, an incubator, a plate reader, and uh, you get the, the growth uh, after an incubation of about 40 hours at 37 degrees. The um, volume required is very low for the microorganism to grow. And the assay has an acceptable accuracy and precision. And because it's a lab-developed test, you have in-house control over the performance. Now, the disadvantages are that it is a lengthy manual assay. As I mentioned, it requires almost two days from start to finish. And if there are antibiotics or antifolates uh, in the specimen, there is some inhibition of the growth. The other two techniques, the protein binding assay and the chromatographic assays, uh, are typically not used in low resource settings. The protein binding assays are commercially available and fully automated, so they are convenient to use. They typically have good precision but questionable accuracy. You don't have any in-house control over the performance, uh, and it has been reported that there is sometimes lot-to-lot -lot variability, making it difficult to track uh, results over time. And what's most important is that different platforms, different uh, kits don't produce comparable results. And that has really been very nicely shown in the uh, Rogers systematic review that uh, Omero pointed out a few minutes ago where it was very difficult to interpret results uh, from so many different uh, manufacturer platforms and to compare data over countries. So uh, next, Aliki. So if I uh, would assign labels, uh, which we're always hesitant to do, I would say that the microbiologic assay can be uh, described as inexpensive and valid, the protein binding assay as easy but not comparable, and the uh, chromatographic assays as expensive and complex. Next. In addition to the advantages that I talked about for the microbiologic assay, it is also important to point out that it is the assay used to derive the cutoff for folate deficiency, i.e. risk of megaloblastic anemia, and insufficiency, risk of neural tube defects. And it is the assay recommended by WHO for population surveys. So all in all, it is a practical choice for low resource labs. Next. 
These are some results from a study uh, Dr. Zhang conducted a few years ago um, where she sent out serum and whole blood samples to eight different laboratories that are doing the folate microbiologic assay. And on the left-hand side, you see the not harmonized results where the laboratories use their in-house reagents. And you can see how um, the results are not that comparable. But on the right-hand side, where uh, they use the CDC reagents, uh, the CDC microorganism and calibrator to measure the same samples, so we had harmonized conditions, you see much better um, comparability of the results and also quite good agreement to the CDC target value. So this really shows that lab-to-lab -lab variability can be greatly improved with the use of common critical reagents. Next. So why do we propose a regional approach? Next. The surveys, national surveys that are done to assess folate status mainly in women of childbearing age are of periodic nature and uh, usually involve a few thousand samples per survey, while a routine laboratory can handle maybe up to 10,000 samples per year. So it is clear that each country has a limited need for blood folate measurements at the population level. I'm not talking here about clinical measurements, but at the population level. And we know that interruptions of routine analysis may lead to problems when the assay is restarted. So it seems that an efficient approach would be to have a network of regional resource laboratories that are proficient at conducting the assay and can perform fee-for-service work for other countries to produce reliable folate data that can be compared across labs and over time. Next. So there are multiple components to a successful capacity building, and that's what I would like to show you next. Omero already showed you this capacity pyramid and made the point that several layers have to be involved to attain, uh, build, and sustain uh, lab capacity. And it definitely entails much more than just training. On the left-hand side in green, I'm showing you the components that we're tackling through this research grant. And those are mainly developing training tools, um, providing laboratory training, um, supplying laboratories with the critical uh, lab supplies, and then in the midterm, initiating work to develop a network of laboratories and to identify an umbrella organization. On the right-hand side, I'm showing you in blue additional components um, that are done separately from this grant, but are equally important. One, the assay kit is because we have time and time again heard from laboratories how difficult it is for them to um, produce uh, an accurate folate calibrator that they can use to uh, calibrate their assay, to uh, produce a robust microorganism that has good uh, growth properties, and to develop their own in-house quality control materials that they can include in each assay to ensure the validity of the results. So we developed an assay kit that has those components and can be made available to public health laboratories that conduct uh, national surveys for a user fee so that they can have a reliable so source for those critical reagents. The other component is a performance verification program. And you can imagine how important it is to have a source for a uh, documentation that laboratories who conduct fee-for-service work produce uh, valid measurements so that the customers have the confidence that they are going to get good quality results when they submit the samples to those laboratories. Next, please. So what are our project goals and objectives? Next. We want to facilitate the development of regional resource laboratories to assess folate insufficiency and monitor prevention strategies globally. And we want to achieve that by training 6 to 12 laboratories worldwide across the six WHO regions, 
provide critical supplies and develop a good training tools such as the video and posters and a training manual. Have the kit available for assay startup as well as for um, ongoing surveys and set up a performance verification program and then initiate steps to develop a network of resource laboratories and to identify an umbrella organization. Next please. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about the training approach that we took. Next. So what we have learned over the last um, years in doing these trainings is you really have to expect the unexpected. You better expect a potential government shutdown, uh, severe weather that may uh, close the laboratory for a day or two, um, trainees that may not get their visa in time to attend the training, etc. So you have to be flexible, you have to accommodate and change your plans, sometimes on the go, but uh, that's just part of the, of the mission and of the job. And so logistical planning is really uh, very important and takes a long time to set up. The technical preparation particularly identifying and fulfilling the supply needs is one of the hardest things. It takes a lot of time and effort and uh, with the most recent um, um, project, we have learned that uh, one has to allow for at least six to eight months to really get that step done. And then the training execution really uh, covers multiple steps, starting with a safety or orientation of the trainees and then the trainers have to demonstrate uh, while the trainees first observe the procedure. Then you have to allow for repeat experiments. You have to review with them the instrument operation and maintenance, teach the proper data review, discuss quality control rules and what makes up a good uh, robust quality assurance program, and then provide them with startup kit and, and supplies so that they can set up the procedure once they get home. And then post-training, there is follow-up to be done, such as assisting with questions and troubleshooting, reviewing and interpreting the trainee lab data, providing guidance on assay improvement, and ultimately determining the proficiency of the laboratory. Next, please. Over the last uh, 12 years or so, we have done a traditional two, sometimes even three week training format. Because of the length of the time it takes from start to finish of one run, over the two weeks, we were able to do approximately five independent runs to see how the trainees are doing. However, uh, this type of format is costly and it is administratively burdensome and requires a lot of uh, lengthy approvals. And so we try to come up with a new shorter training format uh, that is going over just one week. We knew though that we cannot uh, achieve a, a good successful training uh, impact unless we have some good training tools and that is uh, the training video as well as some other training um, tools. And so the participants can review those tools ahead of coming to the training. So they are already pretty well prepared and then they have time for approximately three independent runs when they go home, they still have these good uh, training tools and they can review them uh, time and again to refresh and deepen their understanding. Next, please. This is just a brief uh, pictorial to show you the main um, steps that are involved with a microbiologic assay and um, the parts that we need to uh, highlight and, and go over during the training. Next, please. So let's talk a little bit about the laboratory engagement. Next. There were three levels at which we engaged the laboratories. One was in terms of selecting the appropriate trainee labs and trainees, and that was by specifying some selection criteria both for the institution and the trainee. In terms of the institution, we were looking for laboratories that conduct public health related work, have supportive management and provide laboratory space as well as continuity in personnel. 
uh, equipment and supplies need to be available or readily procurable. And ideally, there should be a quality assurance program in place. In terms of the trainee, we were looking for um, proficiency in written and spoken English. A Bachelor of Science degree is a minimum for trainees to come to the CDC. However, advanced degree or research experiment, experience are highly desirable. It is also very important that the trainees have experience handling biological specimens and good pipetting skills because the microbiologic assay relies heavily on pipetting. And of course, uh, things such as IT proficiency, organizational skills, and so on are critical as with any project. Next, please. The second level of engagement uh, was regarding the needs assessment. And this is really the most um, time intensive one. Uh, we developed uh, detailed supply checklists uh, for essential and for helpful chemicals um, for um, chemical supplies and equipment, a list of approximately 50 items uh, totaling approximately 40,000 US dollars. And what we did for each individual item, we specified how many units are needed, how exactly these items are used, and uh, specified um, things such as if you want to set up the assay, you're going to need this much. If you do a national survey that has 2,000 samples, you need that much to give the labs guidance on how much uh, to budget for and how much to purchase for. Next, please. The third level um, of engaging laboratories was to do a capacity assessment of potential network labs. And for this, we developed a seven part lab readiness questionnaire to have some objective parameters for decision making. And those included things such as proficiency in conducting the microbiologic assay, uh, capacity and willingness to analyze samples for other countries, having skilled um, technical staff and a stable workforce, and of course, appropriate laboratory resources and infrastructure. The first round of this um, capacity questionnaire went out last fall, and there we targeted 18 laboratories from 17 countries. These laboratories already were conducting the microbiologic assay, or they were already set up to attend the training. And 15 of those 18 laboratories responded positively and expressed interest in this uh, approach and in uh, potentially becoming resource laboratories. We're currently conducting a second phase where we're um, sending out these questionnaires to additional laboratories to really have a good balance over the WHO regions. In this approach, we're not targeting laboratories who are already conducting the microbiologic assay, but rather those who have historically played a uh, good and important role in their region as uh, nutrition laboratories to see uh, if there is interest and if there are good compatibilities uh, to further enhance the future network. Next, please. So what progress have we made so far? Next. We developed uh, with a um, professional video production company a 25-minute uh, training video, and it took uh, approximately four months. Uh, it was an uh, intense but also very uh, interesting and inspiring time. And this video is um, freely available um, through the CDC Foundation website. Um, and I can show you a short video clip of about 50 seconds uh, that shows a summary of this video. Uh, Jess, if you could play that. Welcome to the folate microbiologic assay training video. This concludes our training video for the folate microbiologic assay. It is important to remember that this assay is very sensitive at detecting trace levels of folate and therefore you need to work carefully to prevent folate contamination. Use dedicated pipettes, glassware, and workbench to dilute the highly concentrated calibrator and, if possible, a separate sink to clean up your reusable glassware. Also remember to regularly decontaminate the bench surface and pipettes used for sample preparation. 
We hope that you enjoyed this video and that it will help you achieve and maintain proficiency with this important assay. Thanks, Chess. I hope you all enjoyed this. Uh, it was really a lot of fun to put this all together. And so in addition to this uh, training video, we have also generated a series, a series of other training aids to increase the efficiency and effectiveness of the training. And those are um, eight different training posters that show in a uh, visual uh, fashion uh, pictures of each step and then give a short um, caption on what the step is, as well as a, a detailed training manual. Next, please. We have recently trained five countries from four WHO regions, the Philippines, Vietnam, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Tanzania, and then listed it in green in this table, you also see previous labs that we trained. Um, and most of these labs are uh, interested um, and excited about this project and, and uh, maybe good uh, potential resource laboratories in the future network. Next, please. So uh, the last part that I want to talk about is the way forward. Next. Once the newly trained laboratory technicians um, demonstrate the proficiency with the microbiologic assay, they need to put their skills into practice to maintain that proficiency. And that really is best done uh, by analyzing samples, more samples and more samples. And that's really a very good way to um, uh, sharpen those tools, uh, maintain the proficiency, as well as come across different questions, different problems to learn to troubleshoot the assay and understand its, its ins and outs. Um, next, please. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we would like to build a global network of approximately 12 research laboratories that are proficient in the assay across the six region, regions. And we propose to select the research laboratories based on a combination of assay performance and capacity. Next, please. And if um, the project uh, can be extended uh, for another project period, then there are some new proposed uh, components that we uh, would like to do to enhance and expand the reach and impact of this project. And those are to collaborate with a future umbrella organization that will host the network to guide resource laboratories to self-sustainability, to train additional laboratories in order to achieve a good balance and representation in each WHO region, to explore the potential to expand the scope of the research laboratories to other micronutrients, and currently we're envisioning exploring to vitamin B12. Next. And with that, I've reached the end of my talk, and I would really like to thank uh, all the helpful people who assisted in this project and helped to make it a success, starting with the global micronutrient team uh, at CDC here, um, Dorothy Hausman and others at the CDC Foundation, collaborators at Nutrition International, the Foley Task Team, and our colleagues at CDC Birth Defects and the Chronic Centers. And with this, I'd like to close. Thanks for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Christine. What a great presentation, and it really shows the, the depth and breadth of the work that's been done. Um, so congratulations to you and your team and everyone who's been involved in this. We do have time for questions, and we have a number that have come through. We'll try to get to a few of them and then save any others for the end of the, or for the, end of the webinar. So the first question to you, Christine, is the video looks great. How did participants find the training video component as part of the training? Did they feel that it worked well? 
Uh, yes, a great question. And uh, we were really put to test on this because the recent training that we did at the end of January where we tested out the new training video fell in that category of expect the unexpected. Um, we had um, difficulties for the first training day where we couldn't hold it at the CDC. And so we had to do an offsite training where uh, we had no access to a lab. The second day was, was the severe weather thing where the lab was shut down. So we had basically two out of five training days where we couldn't access a lab and we had to make do with other alternatives. And so we were very, very lucky that the uh, five trainees who came were very well prepared, very proficient in different aspects. And uh, we did a lot of dry runs on Monday and Tuesday, answered a lot of questions, reviewed the posters, the video together, and then used the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday very efficiently in the lab. And uh, we were just so thrilled to see how, uh, how good and how um, skilled the trainees were. And we hope that once they now are at home that they will be able to set up successfully the assay once they have all the supplies and everything. But it looked from a first um, impression that everything um, stuck well with them and they um, seemed to be um, knowledgeable about the procedure. And that would not have been possible had we not had the video and the other training tools. Thanks, Christine. It sounds like you got very creative with that training, so I'm glad it worked out. Um, we have another question. You mentioned you're going to reach out to more labs. How would a lab or lab technician be considered for future trainings? Who do we contact? Um, that's a good question. Um, we, I guess, um, probably the best would be to uh, reach out to um, Nutrition International um, in this first instance, uh, maybe, and then things can be uh, channeled to us. Um, at this point, um, the, the future lab training is going to be somewhat limited um, because of resources, obviously. And so um, at, at present, we're not envisioning to be able to conduct a lot of new lab trainings. Um, and so we have to pretty much go with uh, laboratories who uh, play an important role in the region and would have the capacity to do uh, this sort of project. But I think uh, anybody interested uh, could reach out uh, to Nutrition International and then um, discussions could take place in terms of um, what, what could be done further. Thanks, Christine. And we'll have time for just one more question and we'll save the others for the end. And again, any other participants who have additional questions, please submit them to the chat function. The final question at this point, Christine, is why is CDC the best organization to conduct the training? Thanks, Alike. Uh, yeah, good question. So we have done, uh, in terms of um, harmonization and standardization programs, CDC has played a long role over the last 50 years, starting with lipid harmonization and, and standardization cholesterol measurements particularly. And so, Growing up sort of in this environment has sharpened our tools to do this kind of work. And similarly, in terms of training, CDC has played a great role uh, to train uh, different state laboratories and uh, oftentimes also international laboratories. So we feel like we are in this uh, natural environment where this fits very well with our skills and our mission. Um, and so uh, it, it's uh, beneficial to us to know what the needs are outside and beneficial to the partners we're working with uh, to uh, transfer those skills and those technologies. Thanks so much, Christine. Um, we're going to turn our webinar now to actually hear from colleagues who have participated in the training. Over to you, Jess, to introduce our next speaker. Thanks, Aliki. Our next speaker is Renuka Jayatissa. Dr. Jayatissa is currently working as the head of the Department of Nutrition at the Medical Research Institute 
in the Ministry of Health in Sri Lanka. She has obtained her MBBS, MSc, and MD in Community Medicine from the University of Colombo and Public Health and Clinical Nutrition Training in, UK, in the UK. She has worked as a nutrition specialist for UNICEF Colombo for five years as well. She is also an advisor to a multi-sectoral nutrition action plan at the Presidential Secretariat. She is the current president of the Sri Lanka Medical Nutrition Association and a past president of the Nutrition Society of Sri Lanka. Dr. Jayatissa, please take it away. Yeah. Um, thank you for your kind introduction, Jessica. First of all, um, I would like to thank uh, all the organizers uh, in, for the, giving this opportunity for Sri Lanka. So first, uh, I thought uh, now when we really looking at this uh, laboratory uh, assessment and the, something like Sri Lankan experience with the, uh, this laboratory training, um, can we go to next slide, please? Uh, I thought that first I will just brief that uh, why Sri Lanka really need this type of uh, folate assessment and why we have engaged with this training. Uh, the we, Sri Lanka, we don't have much data about the folate, folate deficiency. Uh, so the, we have the very limited data and the, that's also mainly the serum folate level. Uh, the, uh, but uh, we were really looking for this uh, NDT uh, data and the, we had the kind of very kind of limited, uh, we have a national um, surveillance system in the country. So which found that about 4,000 NDT cases um, per year. Uh, but as a result, the uh, country has started the folic acid supplementation program for uh, pre, um, so the, uh, prenatal mothers and then the, which has given the uh, more coverage, like I mean, something like uh, about 50% of the coverage is there at the moment. But at the same time, the country has noticed that uh, due to many supplementation programs, iron deficiency anemia has really gone down, but still the anemia is the same. It is something like uh, one third of our pregnant mothers are anemic at the moment. Uh, so we are a bit puzzled with uh, what is the reason for this anemia, uh, because it's uh, not a problem with the iron deficiency. So then the next one which came up was the folic, uh, folate deficiency. So as a result, uh, so we were really exploring that how are we going to really look at this uh, folate, contri folate, folate contribution for the etiology of anemia. So um, at, that was a kind of a Sri Lankan scenario. We were really looking for the kind of uh, folate um, analysis uh, because uh, serum folic acid, as uh, Christine mentioned, uh, it was not a kind of very good measure. So uh, uh, as a result, we, we want to have a kind of very valid kind of measurement uh, for the, to assess the folate uh, level of the uh, population. Next slide, uh, please. Uh, so at this, uh, then as a result, uh, we had a kind of folic, uh, folic acid uh, uh, consultation in the country at the national level. So the, we had a kind of national level uh, disk review uh, to identify that whether it's a kind of a necessity for the country. So at the, um, and in the, uh, the, uh, as a result of the expert panel um, was appointed by the Minister of Health to assess that uh, what kind of uh, folate interventions are suitable for the country. Uh, but uh, at the moment, uh, then at that time, it was decided that we should really go for the kind of fortification or whether we should go for the supplementation. So, but uh, there were so many arguments uh, with that because without any data, how are we going to tell that the country is having the kind of uh, uh, deficiencies? So the main challenge which came up was um, that we, we are not able to carry out any uh, kind of folate assessment. So as a result, um, uh, because our laboratory is the one, the micronutrient laboratory, so currently, uh, the, my department is uh, handling the National Micronutrient Laboratory. Uh, the main problem is we have a trained staff and the things, but the, this method, assessment method was not really, um, we are, my people are not trained for the things and we are not equipped for the uh, assessment. So which has really become a kind of problem for the Ministry of Health in Sri Lanka. Next slide, please. So that time only the CDC training opportunity came up for the Sri Lanka, especially that I have to thankful for the food fortification in initiative uh, as well as the Nutrition International. 
and then they really forwarded um, our names to the CDC and the uh, kindly CDC has really uh, agreed to uh, include Sri Lanka in the training and it was I think after the assessment and everything we came to the uh, what of their pre-qualification level so that was the reason that we came up uh, uh, we got the opportunity for this training in December to, uh, last year. Uh, the more, when we look at our laboratory, because we are run, we are the National Microinterial Laboratory, they are, uh, therefore we have a basic supplies, as well as uh, it is attached to the Ministry of Health. Uh, as a result, we have a permanent laboratory staff. Uh, the, uh, then the, its a sustainability is not a big issue in our setting. Uh, the, when we uh, really discuss this matter, even the WFP Colombo, uh, they really agreed to support with the, some of the laboratory supplies that have been needed for the um, uh, assessment because which was provided by CDC beforehand. So it was very helpful because it was very comprehensive laboratory list which was provided by CDC. And then uh, later on, even the Nutrition International has supported with the remaining things because which was not really uh, we could not really get some of the supplies from countries setting because we didn't have agents. So uh, unfortunately, CDC and the Nutrition International supported with the, some of the supplies and the bit which really fulfill all the uh, supply list which was really provided by uh, CDC. Next slide, please. Then when we really go to the training, so I mean, I have to tell that it is one of the real comprehensive and step-by-step one of the best training that I have undergone. So because it is really uh, the all the training folders and the posters which have been really added, so which was really done excellently. And uh, especially Mindy and the um, Chami, as they were really very in the individual attentions as well as it was very friendly atmosphere. We never really felt very stressful or it was a kind of, I mean, when, when we have the uh, kind of little bit of um, uh, errors and the things and it was really addressed very friendly manner. So it was one of the best training we ever had. As well as for the repeat and the re-repeat as well as the things they gave the sufficient time because I think our training was it's about two weeks that maybe uh, uh, so we had a bit of the opportunity of having the two weeks training and the, that really improved the, our competency uh, uh, without any word. As the and the other thing is uh, the whole process, the uh, the how the CDC ran the training and how they have maintained the quality control and thing. Actually, as a laboratory manager, it was something that which was very useful for me because I I managed to streamline some of the other tests in my lab also in the same manner. So it was something uh, in addition to the folate training. I got the little bit of more training how to evaluate, how to monitor, and the, how to do the quality control in the in the same training. Uh, next slide, please. So we need really look at the current status. So we did our training in December. Uh, so the, when we came back, we could not really start our um, analysis where, because we didn't have the required uh, lab supplies because it, uh, the shipments came a little late. And the first shipment uh, it received in um, last, I think, two weeks back. Uh, now we are waiting for the second shipment uh, of the supplies that will be in the mid-March. Uh, so we are hoping to really establish the testing uh, most probably in the beginning of April and run and rerun the little bit of the testing um, to establish the test in the, um, uh, our laboratory. Uh, so we further really need some technical support from CDC whenever we really get stuck. I think I, uh, we can always uh, talk to I hope that we can always talk to you and get your support uh, for the uh, future um, uh, establishment. And then the, we are planning to have an, our national migration survey in May, uh, which will be supported by World Bank. Uh, the most, the currently we are really have the, we are, we are planned uh, to collect the, um, uh, the data collection from uh, May. So the, if so that uh, then the, we can really collect our samples as we, plan uh, to do the analysis. Next slide. So the finally that when we really look at the way forward, uh, we are really looking at the complete analysis of the blood sample somehow end of the um, year. 
because that's the kind of uh, time that uh, we we have to really give the not only the folate data we have to give all the monitoring and other data also to the ministry of health so we are hoping to disseminate the data in december 2019 uh, as the things are going on smoothly so we hope that uh, we can uh, finish our work uh, in december uh, and the other thing is um, uh, especially when we are looking as, as a regional hub, even currently we are really uh, helping uh, Maldives and the, some of the labs. So the, we have the, when we are running the samples, we have to estimate the cost per test if we really want to uh, provide the assistance to the, our neighbor countries. Uh, one of the challenges actually I have observed is uh, this uh, availability of the kits as uh, um, uh, Christine has uh, rightly mentioned that its uh, assay kits are available with the small user fee. But uh, currently we have in-house country in -house, uh, country policies, so we can't really go for the international procurements. So the, and the, uh, everything is going through the agents. Uh, so this is uh, some of the one of the challenges we will be facing in the future. Uh, so we would like to get the future support uh, from the Nutrition International at least to kind of support with the things for the this procurement process for us, as well as for the CDC to provide the external quality control and the uh, materials as currently they are doing it for the iodine as well as for the vitamin A. So as the same way for the folate also, then the, we can really maintain our accuracy uh, in the uh, very uh, good manner. Uh, as well as the Nutrition International can really uh, support us linking with the other countries uh, to share the experience as well as uh, the uh, 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 comparing our data with the other countries. Uh, so with that, um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so the, um, for the Sri Lankan, these are the kind of Sri Lankan experience. Uh, and if you have any questions, I can answer. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. Um, we do have a question that uh, I'd like to ask you at this time. What do you think is one of the biggest benefits of the CDC training for Sri Lanka and laboratories around the world? Uh, the one of the biggest um, support for Sri Lanka is uh, because we are in the kind of uh, uh, middle of the things whether we should really fortify our uh, rice and the wheat flour with folate. Um, and the other thing is, uh, so this is a kind of very good um, things to see that with the country really need that type of fortification. Or oh, and the, with the, uh, we have to go for the something else. Yeah, and the other countries, I think that uh, some of the lab, the, even the small divs and the countries, we really support even now that with this kind of microbiological assessment and the, some of the assessment to the countries. So then the, uh, these countries, they can really get the support from us because we have a kind of country to country agreements also. With that type of um, agreements, uh, we can support the other countries, our neighboring countries. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. Um, in the interest of time, I will go move on to our next speaker. Jessica, if you'll please introduce. Great. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Kekishan Begum. Kekishan is a manager at the Nutrition Research Laboratory at the Aga Khan University based in Karachi. She has her Master of Science in Analytical Chemistry from the University of Karachi. Kekishan, please take it away. Hi, good morning. Do you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Good morning there. So it was in January 2019 when I got an opportunity to visit CDC Chambly campus in Atlanta to get training on analyzing RBC folate using WHO recommended microbiology assay method. The training period was of five days and the support was provided by Global Affairs Canada through Folate Task Team Nutrition International. Thanks for your noble work and efforts you are doing. You are trying to make uh, regional lab, you are trying to make a global network of regional labs to control the neural tube bird defects in low and middle income countries. Trainers for this program were very proficient who have contributed their efforts to optimize this essay in a way 
to make it easy to be implemented in the regional lab of low and middle income countries. Next. Thanks. Uh, so there were three main causes or participation in this program as trainee. First, the need of assessing accurate folate deficiency in Pakistan. For this, we needed to have proficiency on a globally recommended quantitative analytical method of measuring folate status. By this, we can plan to for the strategies to be adopted for reducing the folic acid deficiency and its but associated morbidities, especially the neural tube but defects. Next. So now, as it was our first objective, the need to assess folate deficiency in the women of reproductive age in Pakistan. Next. So if we look at the socioeconomic status of Pakistan, we can clearly see that we have economic imbalance prevailing in the country, and more than 75% of the population belong to lower middle or poor class. And as we know that in low income and middle income countries, anemia is a major public health problem as it has been revealed by various health-related studies. Next. Now, if we look at the last National Nutrition Survey of Pakistan that was held in 2011, and it was our lab that was honored to conduct the survey on behalf of government of Pakistan, targeting more than 20,000 sample size. The result reflects that in Pakistan, anemia and folate deficiency prevail among women of reproductive age. Next. So it can be expected that in Pakistan, we might have high risk of observing neural tube bud defects, as shown in a study that was conducted by a hospital in KPK province of Pakistan, reflecting that rate of neural tube bud defects is about 14 per thousand deliveries. That is more than double than that in the developed countries like US and Canada. Next. Another study showed that more than 80% mothers had not taken folic acid during pregnancy, who resulted in neural tube bud defects. Next. For this, we needed to have proficiency on a globally recommended quantitative analytical method of measuring folate status. That was our second objective to apply for participation in this training. Next. As CDC is making efforts for the laboratory harmonization of assessing folate status, we needed to have similar approaches for the essay performance condition to have comparable results. So this could be achieved by getting an opportunity to learn proper PPEs and a specific laboratory working environment required for assuring good quality results. Assuring the lab proficiency by looking at the advanced equipment being used in the standard lab and by observing the standard analytical procedures. Next. By this, we can apply a generalizable cutoff value for folate deficiency assessment if we are sure that the assay techniques and laboratory environment is meeting the requirements of the standard laboratory that is providing this cutoff value like CDC. And as of Pakistan's socioeconomic condition, a cost-effective and reliable technique is required for serving such a highly populated region. And CDC has managed to provide training on such an analytical method for RBC folate analysis. Next. This training program was very attractive for the sake of advancement of nutrition research lab also. As I mentioned earlier that it's our lab that contributes in most of the government of Pakistan's public health related projects and surveys and serve as a quick as, as a quality bank benchmark for other labs all over the Pakistan being the only kept accredited hospital in Pakistan and also one of the topmost biological and biomedical research institute of Pakistan. Mm. Next. Mm. Now I want to share with you the experience of my training at CDC. Next. CDC trainers are indeed very skilled and keen innovative researchers. And it was wonderful experience. The lab was impressively well equipped. They provided us with a cooperative and friendly environment to discuss our challenges. They provided us with an open discussion forum and conducted brainstorming session to achieve informative technical expertise and gave opportunity to have hands-on experience to perform the essay and QC individually. Next. There I came across to see the modified and improved techniques of performing microplate essays. This could be helpful for advancement of our lab as this directed us to make plans for adopting this, these techniques. 
They also helped us with providing the supplies useful for quick and easy performing performance of this microbiology essay and gave us the step-by-step -step practical demonstration of the essay also. Next. Now after this training, I want to share with you our future strategies in this regard. Next. Now we estimate to become a reference lab in the region for assessing RBC folate and to train laboratories on regional basis to individually perform this essay. We do also plan to set a quality control foundation in Pakistan for other laboratories in Pakistan to periodically check their essay performance quality. And most importantly, that we will become able to have a robust folate status in the population of Pakistan and get a way forward for the required interventions for a healthy Pakistan. And for this, we have started collected samples and now we expect to get this essay optimized very soon in our nutrition research lab. Thank you very much. Thank you Next. so much. I really yeah. appreciate your time um, and your presentation about your experiences and all that's happening in Pakistan. There is one question for you at this point. Um, what would you say to decision makers in Pakistan about the importance of MBA and assessing folate status of women in order to gain their support for this work? I would suggest decision makers in Pakistan that by adopting this method, we can accurately assess for the true folate deficiency prevalence in the region, which is of great importance as the folate deficiency leads to neural tube bud defects. And I would strongly recommend to adopt this method in the country for the folate estimate in the women of reproductive age. And after establishing this method, we are ready to help other laboratories in the country as well or in the region to establish the essays themselves. And we can also provide the services to, to other labs in the country. Thank you so much. Um, at this point, we'll hear from Omero Martinez one more time for some summary comments, and then we'll move right into our Q&A period. And we do have a number of questions um, for our speakers. Omero, over to you. the last presentation for this webinar and I just want to share with you several resources available to all that have been developed or compiled by the folic task team. I will present a very brief summary of what we mean by the folic task team. Yes, just please the next slide. So it is led by a very lean secretariat, basically uh, myself, Jess and Aliki who are coordinating uh, this seminar. We formed the secretariat for the team, but we are very strongly supported, next Jess please, by a core working group. This is composed of three individuals with expertise on folate nutrition, epidemiology of birth defect surveillance and programmatic experience. And thanks to Lynn Bailey, Rajesh Mehta and Ronald Afidra, we have been able to fulfill the uh, capacity and, and the work of this uh, uh, working group. Next, uh, please. Uh, this is further supported by an expert advisory group composed of, of a global representation of seven further individuals who bring capacity on laboratory training and capacity building, birth defect surveillance, pediatrics, nutritional program implementation and technical assistance, advocacy and representation of affected populations, food fortification and policy, plus four ex officio members, uh, one senior CVC lab scientist, and four as needed advisors who have been working with us throughout this past 18 months, providing every kind of support that we have uh, reached out for them to provide in, 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 in taking the folk task team ahead. And next, please, just. And further, we get support from a, a larger group of stakeholders and partners who help us uh, bring the, wor the work forward and with a larger representation. So even though the, the, the people, the individuals uh, who are leading this group is a quite reduced number, really the way that it amplifies the work throughout the globe is really uh, um, re a, a, a reflection of how all of these groups and institutions are invested in the work of reducing folate uh, deficiency or folate insufficiency in populations. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, I will now uh, like to share with you a few resources that I mentioned. First, of course, we have our webpage, 
which is uh, it, it sits within Nutrition International. So you can get direct access to the webpage. And we have uh, several updates, news, field stories, advancing the roadmap for action. We have a feature, different publications, different events, and we make available on the webpage the webinars that we have been conducting so far, as well as the, you, you can also have access to the training video that Christine showed us. Next, please. We also provide a summary of the technical consultation, which was initially carried out by the Macronutrient Forum, and how this led the support for the work of the Folic Task Team. This report that you may find in our webpage is uh, available to all the public, and it summarizes the 11 articles that, next please, just the 11 articles that have been published at the annals of the New York Academy of Sciences. All of these articles that you see listed on the right hand of the slide are open access, so any of you can go and, and download them. And this will provide for a much more technical description of the different aspects and the different views that were uh, included in the folate consultation. And next, please. And the folate task team is, is also putting together a series of knowledge briefs that we make available to the public. These are also downloadable from our website. Uh, the first of them, Improving Folate Status in Women of Reproductive Age, summarizes the work of the technical consultation. The second one, the importance of folic acid food fortification, is an advocacy brief that you may use to support your work in your own countries to raise importance and the awareness about the importance of folic acid and how this uh, uh, prevents or helps to prevent neural tube defects. And uh, on the further right, uh, an analysis of the supply chain analysis, summary of the supply chain analysis to assess the feasibility for national food fortification programs. This was very strongly contributed by our partners at the Food Fortification Initiative with a, a tons of experience on the topic. And it, it's a very readable um, piece of information. And uh, next. And lastly, as I mentioned, we have also a link to the Folic Microbiological Assay Training video that can be accessed both at the CDC website and in our own website. So uh, I just want to summarize. This, to my view, has been an outstanding seminar. It really shows for the, fir the first time this global effort to develop the infrastructure needed to conduct a harmonized assessment of red blood cells by means of the microbiological assay. As all of us working in public health nutrition know, the lack of information is a pervasive limitation both to support the need for programs to address them and inform the best kind of interventions, as well as to evaluate the success of these programs and interventions. I am extremely grateful to our presenters who have shared their personal and institutional experience, experience with the activities in which they have participated. I also want to acknowledge all of you who participated on this webinar, both with your presence as well as with your questions and comments. Hopefully you may also continue participating by spreading the word about the newly trained laboratories so that nutrition service to be conducted in low and middle income countries will make good use of this resource and send their samples for harmonized analysis. This will greatly contribute to the global knowledge about folate status in population. Uh, the folate task team is coming close to the first phase of its work and we feel extremely motivated to keep on with the second phase. If funded, as Christine mentioned, we will extend the capacity building activities to include other laboratories following our regionalization model and also plan to extend training to the measurement of other micronutrients. In closing and before getting to the question and answer uh, part of the webinar, I want to thank you all for your participation and hope to see you in our next webinar, which will be announced on our webpage, as well as through social media and other visual means of communication. I turn it over to you, Aliki, for the question and answer part of the webinar. Thanks so much, Omer. I appreciate that. And, and I know our participants appreciate hearing about the work of the task force and the information and, and uh, products available to everyone. Um, we do have a question that I think is best for you, Omero. Um, so the question is, we've heard the terms folate deficiency 
and folate insufficiency mentioned in today's webinar. Can you help us understand the difference with respect to NTDs? Yes, thank you. I think this is a very relevant question. Uh, we are used to speaking about deficiencies, not nutritional deficiencies, micronutrient deficiencies, iron deficiency, anemia, folate deficiency. So deficiency is very much ingrained in the way we address uh, the, the topic when there, are, uh, when there is a need. But insufficient folate levels are related to an increased risk of neural tube defects, while deficient folate levels are related to an increased risk of megaloblastic anemia. And there is a, 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 a very clear distinction among these. If you may think about the deficiency state as a spectrum going from full sufficiency to, uh, to clinical deficiency. So as folate uh, levels start to become insufficient uh, below what is called an optimal level, that uh, marks a risk of an increase uh, incidence of neural tube defects. And this happens way above the level where a deficient state is, is identified, deficiency defined as the risk of megaloblastic anemia. So as the deficiency progresses and the body starts to deplete its body stores and folate level starts to get lower in red blood cells as determined by this microbiological assay that we have been listening to, then the red blood cells start having problems with their, uh, the way that they are formed and this gives uh, and, the, and their concentration of hemoglobin and this is what is known as a megaloblastic anemia. So deficiency happens when there is this clinical anemia with a, 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 a more severe depletion status, but way above that, like three times above that deficient level, we call it folate insufficiency, which brings the folate concentration below the optimal level of um, prevention for neural tube defects. You may read more about these concepts, both in our advocacy brief, which is a very easy read, as well as in the more technical um, publications that I mentioned in the annals of the New York Academy of Sciences. Thank you. Thanks so much, Omero. Uh, the next question is for you, Christine. <clears throat> Why is it important that laboratories around the world use the same assessment method? Uh, okay, uh, thanks, Aliki, for the question. Um, actually, um, if uh, folate testing was standardized, then it actually wouldn't be important that laboratories use the same assessment method. Unfortunately, though, because of the issues that I pointed out in my talk about the difficulties to measure folate um, compounds and the spectrum of folate compounds that has to be captured in that assessment, this um, standardization has not yet taken place, even though various parties have worked on this over the last um, 10 to 20 years, um, but it hasn't yet been achieved. And so until we achieve uh, folate standardization, the only way currently to compare data across laboratories and over time is to harmonize the measurements. And the best we can do to harmonize the measurements is to use uh, the same kind of approach of measurement. And the microbiologic assay is such an approach. And if we go even one step further and use the same common critical reagents that influence the results, such as the calibrator and the microorganism, we really optimize this harmonization and we can achieve the best comparability of data across surveys and over time. And so currently that's just the best we can do so that we can move forward and uh, create better data. But in the long run, uh, the goal is really to standardize measurements. And then once that has happened, then uh, manufacturers are standardized and people who are using manufacturer assays should be getting uh, comparable results. That's really the ultimate goal. It's just this harmonization approach is an intermediate step so that we don't have to um, basically resign to the fact that we just cannot make sense uh, across uh, data and, and we take some measures to better interpret the data until we have the standardization in place. 
Thank you so much, Christine. We do have another question for you. Are the ready to use assay folate kits and the performance verification program available to anyone? Good question. And um, what I would say here is um, we have developed the assay kit to be available to public health laboratories who conduct uh, population work. Uh, if you're conducting clinical work where you're reporting back patient data um, that uh, then leads to medical intervention in that person, uh, you should be using a clinically approved test. The microbiologic assay is not an FDA approved test, nor have we the resources uh, to seek FDA approval. And so it is a test that we ourselves are using for population measurements in the US National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. And we have developed a um, specific material transfer agreement that would go along with um, providing this assay kit to public health laboratories that basically explains how this test uh, can be used and how it shouldn't be used. And so I would say that the kit is restricted in the sense that it should not be used for clinical personal measurements and, and clinical diagnosis. It is restricted to population measurements. As far as the performance verification program goes, uh, it is an open program. It, it does um, carry a user fee. It is mainly geared towards the future resource laboratories, but that's not to say that other laboratories couldn't participate. And this program is um, expanded beyond typical external quality assurance programs that only provide a very small number of samples per year, usually between five and 10 samples at the most per year, and usually just uh, two times a year. So it is very difficult in typical external quality assurance programs to get a good sense of how the laboratory proficiency is over the full range of the measurement concentrations. And so with this uh, performance verification program, we're going to provide a total of 40 samples over the year. There is going to be several challenges over the year. And at the end, we can see over the wider spectrum how the laboratory is doing. And we have the confidence to provide a um, attestation um, um, certificate that uh, shows in terms of comparability to the CDC target values and in terms of imprecision how the lab is doing. Thanks so much, Christine. Um, Omero, we do have a question for you about the folate task team. Um, I know you mentioned a little bit about the continuation, but the question is, um, is, the, is the work over or can you be a little um, more specific on what comes next. Uh, thank you, yes. Uh, you know, the work is not over by any means. Uh, we're coming close to the first phase of uh, our first grant, which was meant to set the stage for the implementation of the roadmap for action, which was delineated on the, uh, during the, the previous technical consultation. So I will say that this is a, a stage, the progression, in which the first step on the way was a technical consultation that allowed us to uh, put our heads together, to think about the roadmap ahead and to understand the most immediate needs. The second step on the way was the establishment of the Foley class team as a convening body that could bring together this global expertise and focus on the most important things, one of them being the training of labs that we have covered all, all during this seminar, as well as other activities that we have been undertaking, including the systematization of some of the information and how to present it to governments and countries. The third stage of the work, which hopefully will begin uh, in May this year, if everything moves according to schedule, will extend for another further three years. And the idea will be to come closer to actual implementation by fostering activities convening a different te technical assistant and working really shoulder to shoulder with in-country experts and in, country, in, in specific needs of the government, specific sectors of the government. So we will identify 
a, a rather small group, I will say, of low to middle income countries, which are closer to initiate activities to control um, the, the for, to understand folly status and to improve folly status to control may, maybe to to uh, to to much of a word but to understand folly status in their populations and to st and to start with intervention programs where needed specifically targeted to women of reproductive age so we do not have the means to carry out the programs we do not have the funds to start uh, fortification programs around the world but we do have we do have the means and we do have the, uh, the expertise and now the recognition to bring together technical ex experts, to bring together the right kind of advocacy, to put together the uh, private and the public sectors to actually make fortification happen. And if not fortification of the typical staple foods, we will be looking at other for, uh, fortification vehicles, for example, salt, bullion cubes or sugar to try to reach the populations most at need. And as part of these efforts, we will continue with the capacity building as Christine uh, has very amply described in this presentation. So I hope that this will answer the question. The work is by no means done, and we certainly would like to continue working, convening, and partnering with other broader stakeholder and partner group and to move the fortification agenda forward. Thanks so much, Amaro. Sorry, I was having trouble with my mute function there for a moment. Um, we do have other questions, but I think in the interest of time and to keep us all on schedule, we'll close at this point. I want to encourage anyone who has additional questions to please submit them to Nutrition International's Folate Task Team, and um, we'd be happy to get back to you um, with answers as we can. Um, I want to thank our speakers and our participants for joining us today. We timed this um, webinar for today um, in conjunction with yesterday's World Birth Defects Day. Uh, the Folate Task Team of Nutrition International is a partner with the International Clearinghouse for Birth Defects um, in celebrating World Birth Defects Day and um, trying to elevate um, and um, amplify the voice of those who are working tirelessly around the globe to um, support those living with birth defects and also um, to work on prevention measures where possible. Um, again, I thank our speakers and participants for joining us today. A recording of this webinar will be available in the coming days on the Folate Task Team website, and we'll send a message out to all those who registered for the webinar. Um, so you'll know when that does go live, and please feel free to share those with colleagues and constituents. Um, at this time, we'll close, and I appreciate your time. Enjoy the rest of the day.